I'm going to invite you to take uh, your Bibles or your Bible apps. I know, I, the, the cutest amen ever over there, right? They uh, got to love that. Um, take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Uh, we're continuing our series called Just Jesus. We are spending the year in the Gospel of Luke, learning from Jesus uh, what he said, what he did, how he treated people, what he taught. And right now we're in a series on practical wisdom. The things that Jesus teaches us that we need to, to embrace and live that will change our lives. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look a lot like this one. Turn to page 1115 and you will find our text for the day in Luke 18. Uh, hey, have you ever experienced an injustice? Anybody here ever experienced an injustice? You know, not that many hands went up. So I don't know what's been happening in your life, but you've never gotten the raw end of the deal. You've never been falsely accused. Uh, no one's ever cheated you out of anything. Uh, so have you ever, ever had any of those things happen? Injustice in your life? Okay, there we go. Lots of hands go up. See, it doesn't matter if it's the legal system, if it's your job, a government agency, or in school. It's frustrating to be in that place where you're the victim of injustice. Uh, it, that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, what do we do, how do we respond, just kind of, you know, sinks into our soul. Uh, Jesus understands injustice. The, the entire story of his arrest, his crucifixion, his resurrection was all about injustice. I mean, he was put on trial and people just lied about what he said, what he did. Uh, you know, they slandered him. The, the, the decision was rigged from the beginning. Uh, the people that... that you know, sentenced Jesus to death, it was already decided what was going to happen before he ever had a trial. So he gets injustice. He understands it. And today he uses it as a teaching point on prayer. So I want you to hear this interesting and sometimes confusing parable that Jesus told that can change our mindset and really kind of reduce our frustration level if we apply it to our lives. Uh, Luke chapter 18 is our text, beginning in verse 1, and it's called the parable of the persistent widow, or sometimes the parable of the unjust judge. And, and uh, a parable is just a story that Jesus tells trying to teach us an eternal truth, something that really matters. Uh, Luke 18, it says, And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? There's a simple admonition that Jesus offers to begin this teaching. He simply says to everyone who's listening, always pray and do not lose heart. Always pray and do not lose heart. That phrase is the key to understanding this passage because it, it says in verse 1, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So that's what Jesus wants us to get. All of us need to understand God wants us to continue praying and not give up or lose hope. So... Uh, to illustrate that point, Jesus tells the parable, and he shows us a picture of human justice. Now, when we talk about human justice, Jesus is talking to the poorest of the poor. He's talking to people that have no rights. They have no power. They have no wealth. They aren't connected. They have no influence. They are the, the forgotten people, and so they understand injustice. They're living as victims of injustice on a continual basis. They knew authorities like the judge. They knew people like that. By the way, do you ever read Scripture and, and you think of somebody in a story? You're like, oh, that's just like so-and-so. I, I hope you're not reading about Satan when you think that. But uh, 
the, uh, the thing is, they, they got this whole judge thing down. I mean, he was a man who didn't fear God. And, and when you say to someone they don't fear God, that means that they don't fear the consequences of their actions. They, they don't worry about Judgment Day. They're not thinking about the, the, what's going to happen to them because of their decisions. And then they, he didn't respect man. He, he didn't care about people. He didn't care about their feelings. He didn't care about what happened. He didn't care about justice. Uh, he was harsh, callous, unjust. Jesus calls him unrighteous. We might call him corrupt. Just didn't care. So they knew the judge, but they also understood the widow. She was captive to a corrupt system. She was helpless to advance her complaint. So she does the only thing that she can do. She shows up day after day after day saying to the judge, will you please take up my case? Will you please bring me justice? Will you please be my defender? And he just blows her off for a long time. Don't care, don't have time, don't, not going to pay attention to it. And finally he goes, well, I guess I might as well do something or else this lady's going to drive me nuts. She is so persistent that the unrighteous judge gives her justice. Now, one of the misinterpretations of this passage is that some people think that God wants us to pester him so we'll get our prayers answered. That is not the case. God does not want you just to try and annoy him into giving you what you want. And some, even in more misunderstood, equate the evil judge with God. Somehow they think that's a picture of God, and nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, so if you're here, and you're upset at the injustice in your life, uh, maybe you're frustrated that God hasn't given you justice. Maybe you think that God is unfair or uncaring. Maybe you're just hopeless because you feel trapped in a system that is corrupt. Uh, hear Jesus when he says, Always pray and do not lose heart. Because he's speaking to us. He wants us to continue praying and not lose heart. And he wants us to see God the way that, well, the way that God is. He wants us to see God for who he is. So see the picture of God's justice. Look at this, verse 7 again. Jesus says, And will not God give justice to his elect, to his people? who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? You see, Jesus uses this unrighteous judge as a contrast to the living God. In other words, he's an opposite. It's not he's like he's saying this is what God represents. No, the judge is in contrast. Judge is over here. God is over here. You have an unrighteous judge with this lady, and God is the righteous judge. Uh, so Jesus is telling us that like the judge didn't care about that lady, God cares about you. God is for you. God loves you. And he will fight for you to provide you with justice. Did you catch that? Jesus wants us to understand that the living God is for you. He cares about you, and he wants to take up your cause. He wants to advance your life. He wants you to experience justice. And, and we, we get this when we, we hear Jesus teach about prayer a little more extensively back in Luke chapter 11. I'd encourage you to turn back about 10 pages in your Bible to Luke chapter 11. Listen to what Jesus says, uh, again, in a longer passage about prayer, where he captures this, this element of God being for us. Uh, verse 9 of Luke 11, Jesus says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You see, when we come to God with a request, with a petition, with uh, uh, something that we want Him to do, it doesn't matter whether it's for justice or provision or healing or wisdom, uh, we begin at the point of relationship. Relationship. God is our Father. That's why we pray, our Father who art in heaven. God is our Father. God loves us. 
And this applies to you if you have that love relationship with Jesus Christ. So have you come to that point in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. I love the fact that we get to start the service with people declaring their faith in baptism. They want the world to know they're followers of Jesus. They have that love relationship with the Son of God. So it begins with relationship. And if you have that relationship with God, then God loves you. Understand that. You're in that love relationship. So uh, how many parents are in the room? Yeah, lots of your parents. How many of you parents love your kids? Okay, the hands say, yeah, I was like, yeah, of course we love. How many, how many parents love your grandkids? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're like, yeah, we love our kids. We love our grandkids. Let's do that. See, the, uh, here's the reality. We love our kids. As much as you love your kids, as much as you love your grandkids, God loves you more than that. See, we can't even conceive that because we love completely. We're like, oh, no, my kids, my grandkids, they're just so awesome. They're wonderful. God loves you more than that. God loves you more than you love your children because we're in this relationship. And when you come to God in prayer, it's the, it's the act of approaching your loving father to make a request. There's no fear. He's not going to blow you off like the unjust judge. There's no doubt that he cares for you. And because of this relationship, that we have with God, this love relationship. We know that God wants to bless us. He wants to provide us with blessing. Uh, did you catch this in verse 11 and 12? This is Jesus telling us what God is like. He says to us, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a snake? Hey, any of those dads in the room? No, you wouldn't do that because you guys are afraid of snakes too. <laughs> right? You're not going to pick up a rattler and give it to your kid because he's hungry. Hey, Dad, can we go to Burger King? No, but you can have a snake. See, we wouldn't do that. You go, well, that, that creepy dad right there. Nobody's going to do that. And Jesus says, look, you guys are, are evil. Okay, we're sinful. We're selfish. And if we being selfish, self-destructive people know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more does our Heavenly Father going to bless us? So get this. God loves perfectly, and his desire is to bless. He wants to be generous. He wants to show kindness. God actually wants you to be successful. Now stop right there, because there's a lot of televangelists who will say that and mean something completely different. When I say God wants you to be successful, he wants you to be successful by his definition, not yours. See, our definition usually involves stuff like money and power and fame and, and all that kind of stuff. God's definition of success is a life filled with love and joy and purpose. God's idea of success is for you to, to have a wonderful relationship with your spouse, for you to have a family that loves each other and, and celebrates life together, for you to make a difference in this world for the kingdom of God. God wants you to be successful. He's for you. He wants to bless your life because he loves to bless his children. Now, I've got to pause just for a moment and ask you this. Maybe this question will kind of stay with you all week long. Do you really believe that God wants to bless you? Do you really know that God loves you and wants to be for you in your life? Because there's a lot of people I've met that kind of go, yeah, I know God loves us and God loves people, but they really struggle to feel like God loves them because of things they've done, because of ways they've failed. Uh, and, and, and I want you to understand, this is personal. God loves you, and he wants to bless you because you're his child in the same way that you want to bless your children. Even when your children are idiots, you want to bless them. Right? We're that way? Well, that's how God is. He wants to bless us. And God is responsive to his children. Not like the judge. God is responsive. Right? In chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Do you know what that means? Jesus is telling us that God's default response to you and I as his children is yes. I have this theory of parenting, uh, just kind of something I've observed uh, a lot of, and, and uh, you guys can talk about this over lunch and figure out if who's, who's who, and, and if it causes a fight in your family, that's okay. We have counseling available here too. Um, <laughs> 
But what I've observed is that um, in, in most couples, you know, as parents, one is a default yes and one is a default no. A default no means that if a child comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, can I do this? Can I go here? Can I have that? Your default answer is no. You have to give me a reason to give it to you. And the other parent usually is a default yes, right? So they come to you and you go, oh, of course you can do that. You have to give me a reason to say no. Now, you guys can figure out over lunch who's who in your family, but uh, like I said, we have counseling uh, available if you need it. But here's the thing. God is a default yes parent to us. He wants to bless us. He wants to, to bring good into our lives always. Now, some of you are going, well, if that's the case, how come I'm not getting what I'm asking for? Well, the Bible actually tells us that too. Some of you need to go home and read James chapter 4. James is the brother of Jesus, and in chapter 4 uh, of his letter, he kind of writes about why we don't get the stuff we want. First of all, James says we don't get what we want because we don't even ask God for it. We're kind of living in this default, well, it's what I want, but we don't ever go to God and say, God, can I have this? Can I, will you give it to me, please? And then James goes on to say, you ask and you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. In other words, you want to be selfish. You, you want to be self-destructive. And no parent in, in their right mind is going to enable their children to be selfish and self-destructive. And so we ask for things, and God says, no, I can't give that to you because I love you, and I want to bless you, and if I give that to you, it'll hurt you, and it'll hurt the people that you love. So he says no. It's kind of like if your three-year-old comes up and says, hey, can I play with your hunting knife? What are you going to say? Well, don't answer that, because some of you might go, well, sure. No, you're going to say no. So that's why God sometimes says no to us, even though he's default yes. He hears us, and he answers. He's responsive. The question that we have is time. God, when are you going to answer? Especially when in this text, I don't know if you noticed this or not, Jesus says that God will answer speedily. Did you catch that in verse 8? Again, back in uh, chapter 18 now. Jesus says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Really? I read that and I went, really? According to whom? I'm just going to confess, I'm a lot of times impatient, right? Am I the only one in this room that ever kind of goes, God, what are you up to? God, when are you going to answer this prayer? God, I've asked you for this. Why are you not, you know, when are you going to heal? When are you going to redeem? When are you going to provide? The truth is, God does. He does answer. He does provide. He does heal. He does redeem. He just does it in his time. Not in our time. Not quickly, according to his impatient, dare I say, immature children. I, I kind of got this picture as I was thinking about this. Because, uh, you know, in the relationship with God, he's the father. That makes us the children, right? And, and I, no, no, we like to think of ourselves as adult children, mature, responsible, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, a lot of times we come to God in our prayer life, and we're like the toddler in the grocery store that wants the candy now. Can I have the candy? No. Can I have the candy? No. Can I have the candy? Can I, have the candy? I want the candy. I want the candy. We do that to God, and he's like, uh, just wait a second. Wait a moment. I will bless you in time. Remember, God is the righteous judge. And also remember that everyone will give an account to God. Everyone. Justice will happen speedily in the context of eternity. You guys do realize that eternity is but a moment away. It's but a moment away. And we lose that perspective because we are impatient and we are immature and we want now. And, and, and God is patient. 2 Peter chapter 3 uh, uses this analogy. It's not to be taken literally. It's to explain a concept, but I, I wanted to play with it a little bit literally. Uh, Peter tells us that to, to the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. In, in other words, he's trying to tell us that time is irrelevant to God because he's outside of time. Eternity is forever. But guess what, folks? There's not going to be a calendar. Okay, in eternity, we're not going to go, it's the 12th of forever. That's cool. Uh, it, it's just 
It, it's timeless. And so time is irrelevant to God as we think about time. We get in a hurry because we're on a clock. But if a day is as a thousand years to God, I decided, okay, I'm going to do some math. And if this was literal, this is what it'd look like. If a day is as a thousand years, then one hour is 42 years in eternity. You like that? Do you know what? One minute is eight and a half months in eternity. See, I read that and I went, wow, most of us in this room are not even two hours old. We didn't fall off the truck yesterday. We fell off this morning. <laughs> I mean, come on. One minute is eight and a half months. So in, in context of eternity, think about this. Because of the relationship with God where we know he loves us, because we know he wants to bless us, we decide that we're going to trust our Father to do what's best for us in His timing. So we always pray, and we don't lose heart. Let, let me just tell you what that looks like in my life, related to this project. You know, 18 months ago, we broke ground on the Sweetwater campus, and, and I decided when we broke ground that every day when I drove by, every time I drove by this campus, I would pray for uh, God to... to to do this. And, and, my, and my prayer was kind of threefold. First of all, I prayed that God would build it. And, uh, and he answered that prayer. We're in the building right now, in case you didn't know that. Okay, Sweetwater Campus, week number two. Uh, here we are, and we're in. So God answered that prayer. But understand, God answered that prayer five and a half months long, later than I asked him to. Okay, I was targeting first of the year. We get in the middle of May. And that means that uh, I, uh, God's answer was like, 35 seconds later than I wanted it. So I'm being impatient and struggling with that, and God's like saying, hey, just wait a few seconds, Chad. You'll be in. And, and, and so I'd pray God build it, and I'd pray God fill it to overflowing. Fill it to overflowing. Why? Because our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what we're all about, celebrating baptism, seeing the power of God changing people's lives. And so we want to fill this up to overflowing. Why? Because that represents men and women, boys and girls, whose lives are changed forever by Jesus. And you know what? God's in the process of doing that. How quickly he does that is dependent upon his plan and our obedience. And then I prayed not only that God would build it and fill it up to overflowing, but God would pay for it. Um, yeah, I want God to pay for it. I'd ask him. Because he can. He can pay for it. By the way, in case you're wondering, we have a mortgage on this building. It's uh, mortgaged at about $3 million. Uh, we raised a third of the cash to pay for the building and all the furnishings and that kind of stuff. We are healthy financially. It's not like it's a struggle. Our, our stewardship team saved up a couple of years' worth of payments against the mortgage uh, so that uh, we don't have to worry about that stuff. Okay, so we're in great shape. But here's the thing. I'm still asking God to pay for it now. I'm asking God, you know, just send us the $3 million donation so we can be done with the debt and move on to next. And, I, and you know what? God can do that. And you know what he tells me? <laughs> just wait. I'm hoping it's not like wait an hour. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping it's like wait a second. But uh, that's up to God in his time. You see, God answers our prayers in his time, in his way to bless us and to help every one of us become more like Jesus. Our part is to trust God. Our part is to always pray and not lose heart. So right now, uh, what are you praying for? Who are you praying for? Are you losing hope or are you enduring with expectation? Because uh, Jesus ends this passage with the question, do you notice this in verse, uh, the end of verse 8? He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus returns, is he going to find his people being faithful? Is he going to find us trusting God and praying with an expectant heart? In other words, as a follower of Jesus, uh, when God comes back, is he going to find you believing the Bible? Well, God finds you believing the Bible. Um, this is his words of wisdom. This is his directions for life. Here at Calvary, we put it this way. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. 
And so we teach it, and we encourage you to read it, and that's why we give Bibles away, because we know that if you read God's Word, it will change your life, and, and we believe that so much that we put our money where our mouth is, because we want you to know what God says. So do you base your beliefs on God's Word? Are you living according to Jesus' wisdom? Uh, right now in our world, in our culture, Scripture is less important than ever. It, it is often derided, and try, they try to discredit it, uh, and those who actually believe the Bible are openly mocked. So what about you? Are you trusting God's word? Is the Son of Man going to find you believing the Bible? And is he going to find you acting on God's promises? See, trust is action based on belief. So if you believe God's word, are you actually living God's Word? Or only are they just words of faith that you read and sing and say? Um, do you apply God's Word to your life? Does it influence your daily decisions? Does it influence your relationships, how you treat one another? See, last week we talked about Jesus' warning in Luke chapter 6, where he said, look, if you hear my words and you put them into practice, you're like the wise man who built his house on the rock. It had a foundation. It was strong. When the storms came, your life stood. But if you hear my words and you ignore them, you're like the foolish man who built his house without a foundation on the sand, and when the storms came, your life collapsed. Are you going to be found acting on God's promises? And are you going to be found persevering for God's purpose? Uh, the widow never quit. She never gave up. She endured and her request was taken care of. In other words, don't give up. Jesus said, always pray and don't lose heart. So don't give up. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God working the miracles in your life. Don't give up on God redeeming your life. Don't give up on God using you to influence your family, your friends for the kingdom of God, leading them to that place of a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Don't give up up. I was reading this text and, and hearing Jesus say, always pray and don't lose heart. And I thought about the story uh, of this uh, wonderful couple called Dorothy and Leo. Uh, I met Dorothy and Leo when they were later in life. They'd moved here to Lake Havasu as they got older to live with uh, next door to their daughter and son-in-law who, who took care of them. And uh, Dorothy was one of the sweetest ladies you would ever meet. I mean, she was humble. She was quiet. She was just, just, just the, the sweet, kind lady that, that you just go, that's what a Christian looks like. And she was faithful to God. She attended church all the time. She'd been serving God for a long time. Leo, uh, not so much. Leo had allowed Dorothy to go to church all those years. And she'd been praying for her husband and being a faithful wife, but he didn't go to church with her. He didn't, he, you know, whatever Dorothy was, Leo was kind of the other side of it. And yet they endured together and she prayed for him. Uh, and as they moved here, you know, uh, getting older in years, uh, Leo got a little bit insecure. And so he sort of wanted to go everywhere with his wife. And so when she went to the grocery store, Leo went to the grocery store with her. When she went to the doctor, Leo went to the doctor with her. And guess what? Dorothy was faithful in coming to church. And Leo came to Calvary with her. Now, he didn't always seem to enjoy it, uh, but he came and he sat there. And for years, he heard the, the message that Jesus loves you, that he forgives you of all your sins. He died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he, he, he would redeem any life that comes to him. It was uh, in 1997, I got a call one day out of the blue, totally unexpected, saying that Leo wanted to see me now. Now, Leo didn't like preachers coming to the house. In fact, I've been told, don't go visit uh, Dorothy because Leo will, will not be happy about that. And, but Leo wanted to see me now. And so I dropped what I was doing and I drove over to his house. And, uh, and Leo was adamant that he trusts Jesus today. So we sat, we talked, you know, I said, you understand, Jesus, you know, forgave you of your sins. He died on the cross. You believe in him. You want to confess him as Lord of your life. He said, yes. We prayed together. Uh, probably a week or so later, he was baptized. And about two weeks later, Leo met Jesus face to face. 89 years old when he came to faith in Christ. And we can all go a while ago. That's great for Leo. But here's the point of the story. 
Dorothy did what Jesus said. For over 60 years, she always prayed and she did not lose heart. And God answered her prayer. In the most unexpected way, unexpected timing. So today, will you trust God? Will you keep praying? Because he is at work redeeming people and changing lives. And he will redeem your life. He will answer your prayers if you do not give up. Now, I, uh, I share this and I close this by, by saying this. I know that in a crowd this big, there's some of you that are really struggling with enduring. You feel like giving up. Maybe your faith is wavering. Maybe you're struggling with something in particular. Maybe you just kind of believe that maybe God isn't paying attention to your prayers today. And, and today, I just want you to know that God is saying to you, keep praying, don't lose heart, don't give up. And at the end of the service, members of our prayer team are going to be here across the front. And they're just going to be waiting for you. Uh, and if you've kind of gotten to that place where you've lost heart, where life is a struggle, uh, let them pray with you. Let them pray for you. Let them maybe rekindle that spark of faith that's dying out in your life. Because here's what I know. God wants you to hear that simple admonition. To hold on to him, keep praying, and not give up, and see the miracles that he wants to work in your life and in the life of your loved ones. Pray with me.